So uh, thank you uh, everyone for attending this uh, um, uh, second to last uh, Department of Surgery uh, Didactic Succeed lecture series. And I'm really excited to um, uh, present uh, our, our uh, featured guest today, um, uh, Dr. Ho Fan. Um, and I'm supposed to record, I guess we are recording, um, and because uh, Dr. Farmer wants to make sure, um, are we recording already? Hi, Dr. Cook. Yes, I pressed the record button, so we're recording. Okay, great, great. So um, uh, um, Dr. Fans today is gonna to, uh, talk about providing meaningful feedback. And um, many of us, if not all of us are educators. Uh, we're faculty educators, resident educators. Uh, we encounter trainees and students and really providing um, good, meaningful feedback um, is uh, important to the success of not only our faculty, but our trainees. A little background, uh, Dr. Fan graduated from the University of California uh, in Los Angeles, uh, otherwise known as UCLA, in 1995 with a degree in molecular biology. He received his MD degree from Meharry uh, Medical College in 2000. He completed his general surgery training right here at UC Davis in 2007, which also included a two-year research fellowship uh, at Shriners Hospital. He then completed a one-year surgical critical care fellowship at UC Davis and joined the, our Department of Surgery faculty in 2008. Currently, Dr. Fan is a health sciences professor in the Department of Surgery. He's active in the field of trauma, acute care surgery, and surgical critical care, uh, and in medical student education, where he serves as the instructor of record uh, for our, surge, our third year um, uh, uh, surgery core clerkship. Uh, and without further ado, I'll present Dr. Pham. Um, and then um, um, there's also a possibility for uh, uh, CME credit uh, if you are so interested. Uh, thank you very much. And I present to you, Dr. Pham. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Let me share my screen. Uh, make sure that I have sound and video clip uh sharing you should be uh you should see my uh screen well uh let me see let me swap side real quick you see the big uh screen now right not the small screen anymore correct exactly all right thank you um all right, so uh, the talk as Dr. Cook uh, is saying is that it's about providing meaningful feedback. I wanted to change it to effective feedback, but I think I'm just gonna leave it at meaningful feedback, even though those two words I'm gonna be sort of interchanging throughout the talk. Um, so I have nothing to disclose except for one thing. Uh, so having some knowledge about giving feedback doesn't mean that I'm really good at giving feedback. I just wanna disclose that. Uh, however, um, uh, having the knowledge uh, does uh, make me want to uh, always strive to do better and uh, learn to uh, give better feedback. Uh, also, uh, it helps me to, uh, in terms of medical student curriculum, uh, to know when and how and where to incorporate feedback in uh, as part of their uh, curriculum. All right, so uh, this is the outline of the talk. Um, uh, first is why give feedback? And then we'll touch a little bit on some of the barriers uh, to giving feedback. And then uh, we'll, we'll talk about the process of giving an effective feedback. Um, so that's gonna be the bulk of the talk, hopefully in the middle there. And then we'll talk about the models of feedback delivery. There are several models. I will touch on some of the more commonly used ones. And then hopefully I will end with some take home message that everyone can use. So let's start with why we should be giving feedback. So feedback is an integral part of the learning process. We are all familiar with a century old apprenticeship model in which students learn by role modeling. So in this model, the apprentice watch the master do his job and then learn from watching and doing. So this is sort of exemplified by the famous surgery mantra, you know, see one, do one, teach one. Uh, but without feedback from the master, this model would not be as effective. So feedback allows the learner to calibrate their performance and to formulate plans to close a gap between the current and expected performance. So learning usually begins with delivering the, uh, by defining the educational goals and objectives. 
So the teachers will then give the students instructions on how to achieve the goals and objectives. And then the student's job is to study and practice the set skills. Along the way, the student will self-assess and the teacher will evaluate the student's progress and where they are in a meeting. Uh, so, and also kind of evaluate where they are in meeting the objectives. So this is called feedback. So the self-assessment and the feedback will allow the student to modify their behaviors toward meeting the goals and objectives. That will complete the, uh, this, the learning cycle. So why is feedback important in medical, uh, medical education? So studies have shown that feedback enhances medical student satisfaction. So Tori and college, uh, our colleagues um, demonstrated that provision of bedside feedback, among other things, is a strong indicator of fellowship quality. So provision of feedback has also been shown to improve students and residents' clinical performance. Feedback will also improve the accuracy of the learner's self-assessment. So over time, the process of receiving feedback can help the learner self-reflect and learn to identify their own learning needs. Uh, and they can then design uh, improvement plans uh, with uh, less faculty supervision. And then lastly, studies have also shown that feedback particularly uh, from the patients will lead to changes in physician, uh, physician's behaviors that will result in improved patient satisfaction. So in the absence of feedback, the students may mistakenly assume that they are doing well, even though they may uh, be making serious errors. Conversely, students may think that they are doing poorly, resulting in damage in the self-esteem. Students may feel uncertain about the performance and therefore they are unclear about what they need to do to improve. And if feedback is not given during the rotation, the student or residents will learn about the shortcoming only after the fact, and there's no more opportunity for them to affect change. So without feedback from the teachers, students and residents may sense that the teachers are disinterested. So I also want to, um, it, it's sort of important to also differentiate between uh, formative and summative feedback, even though both of them are labeled as feedback. So formative feedback is designed to improve future performance. And the key word here is future. It is usually given throughout the course of the rotation and is given frequently. The nature of the feedback is usually low stake um, and it is meant for the learner to improve and it is not meant for a formal evaluation. On the other hand, the summative feedback is an evaluation, more like an evaluation. It is designed to evaluate past performances the key word here is again, past. And essentially it is a cumulative performance report uh, usually done at the end of the cycle. It is generally high stake. Um, both of these are important, but today we will focus mostly on formative feedback. So if feedback is that important in the learning process, why are we not doing enough of it? Uh, so it turns out that there are a lot of barriers to giving feedback. So faculty may not feel equipped to give uh, effective feedback, especially in the med med uh, medical education field. Faculty say that they were never formally trained to give feedback. Faculty also say that they do not have the time or the public space to give feedback given the rigorous clinical demands. Faculty are also reluctant to give negative feedback for fear of it interfering with the teacher-student relationship and the fear that the uh, negative feedback will also evoke um, heightened emotions that is difficult to deal with um, is also brought up as a, uh, as a barrier to giving feedback. Uh, faculty may also fear retribution from the learner such as a negative faculty evaluations. Some may believe that feedback is ineffective and does not change behaviors. And um, the last one, uh, the lack of institutional culture of giving feedback is also an important barrier and that needs to be addressed as well. So generally speaking, the learners usually perceive that they do not receive sufficient feedback. So this is, is clearly shown in the medical student graduation questionnaires. I think only about 67% or so of our uh, students report that they receive any form of feedback during the surgery rotation. And I think the other uh, studies have shown even worse uh, numbers, uh, especially during uh, residency. I think one uh, study even uh, stated only 20% of uh, residents uh, stated that they receive any form of feedback during uh, rotations. Uh, 
So part of this is because feedback are often given unannounced and they may go unnoticed by the students. But in the same token, teachers often overestimate the amount of feedback that they give. So this is often due to the reasons that I mentioned in the previous slide. So this disharmony of expectations of giving and of receiving feedback leads to dissatisfaction from the uh, dissatisfaction from, from the students with the faculty, with the rotation, and with the learning environment. Um, so, um, at any rate, uh, in the in this coming session, um, I'm going to be focusing on the process of giving an effective feedback uh, that is generally recommended by the experts and also by the literature out there. And hopefully by following some of this process, we can at least address some of the barriers that's mentioned, particularly the, it has to do with the training and the fear of uh, retribution and the uh, fear of, uh, of creating um, uh, uh, heightened emotions. So according to Hattie and Timperley, uh, an effective feedback needs to answer these three questions. Where am I going to? How am I going? And where to next? So the first question, where am I going, is related to the goals of the learning experience. What is it that the learner needs to accomplish? So the second question is, how am I going? Provides information about the learner's current performance compared to the goals. And the third question, where to next, refers to the plan for further learning and performance improvement. So in other words, a feedback should tell the learner where they need to be, where they are at currently, and what they need to do to get there. So an effective feedback is not a unidirectional conversation. Feedback should be a bi-directional process. Feedback requires that the learner not only welcome feedback, but also be an active participant in the discussion. In general, feedback should only be provided when the learner welcomes it. Otherwise, it would not likely be accepted. When the learner is engaged in a feedback session, the learner should be asked to self-assess. This provides information regarding the learner's insight and understanding, understanding of his or her ability. And it also can be used as a guide for the discussion that follows. So effective feedback should be based on goals and objectives. So before, learning, uh, before the learning activity, um, the, uh, the teacher should discuss with the learner about the goal and objectives of the activity. So the teacher can suggest the learning goal. For example, the teacher may say, I noticed that you had some difficulty with dissecting out the triangle hello last time. Let's work on that today. Alternatively, uh, alternatively, the teacher can invite the learner to define what he or she wants to work on. So for example, what aspect of the lab code do you want to work on this time? So whatever the goal of the learning activity is, it needs to be understood and agreeable by both the teacher and the learner. Goal setting will increase the likelihood that the teacher, or excuse me, the likelihood that a learner would accept the feedback and therefore increases the effectiveness of the feedback. So feedback should also be timed to achieve the best outcome. So feedback that are directed at improving technical skills should be given in real time to allow the learner to correct performance. So feedback should be given as close to the, uh, to the performance as possible. If too much time is lapsed, then the activity and the feedback um, uh, lapse between the activity and the feedback, the memory and the effect will, be, uh, will fade and will be less effective. The learner should be given advance notice uh, of the feedback so that, the, um, so that he or she can prepare to receive feedback. So the teacher may warn the learner that he or she will receive feedback at the end of the clinical encounter or at the end of the surgical case. So the example I gave on, the, let's talk about your history taking skills after this patient encounter, or let's debrief at the end of the case to talk about your performance. As obvious as it may sound, when feedback is given, it should be announced. Oftentimes, unannounced feedback may go unnoticed by the learner. The teacher may want to say, I'm about to give you some feedback on that patient account or something of that sort. When giving corrective feedback, the overall uh, all tone of the conversation should be respectful and supportive. Um, the body language should also be neutral. So considering sitting next to the learner rather than sitting behind the desk, 
the language you use should be as neutral and descriptive as possible, focusing on the behaviors that need correction. So the teacher may wanna say, I noticed you decided not to explore further when the patient mentioned his loss of appetite, rather than saying you were unconcerned about his loss of appetite. One is focused more on the action and the other one is more focused on um, uh, the, uh, the interpretation of the, um, uh, of, the, of the individual. So judgmental language may lead to the learner's defensiveness and rejection of the feedback. So only feedback that is based on observation, direct observation is viewed by the learner as credible. So feedback should also be focused on specific behaviors. So spell out exactly what was positive and what is lacking, give specific examples from the action that you observed. So this is an example of feedback from one of our own faculty. Your clinic notes is thorough and well-written and remember to include the time that you saw the patient as a habit. It is also a good habit, particularly for new patients to include doses and frequency for medications, as well as actual names where you can get the information. Whenever I collect history about past surgery, I think it's important to include when and for what reason. I listen to you ask these questions, so I know you thought about it. So as you can see, the comments made are based on specific behavior that were directly observed, and this lends a feedback credibility. The feedback should also focus on the behaviors rather than the person. So describe the uh, specific behaviors or actions that need to be modified or corrected. So try to use verbs and describe behaviors rather than adjectives, uh, adjectives or adverbs. For example, the teacher may wanna say something like, I noticed you interrupted the patient when he was telling you about important family history rather than you were impatient when the patient was telling you about his family history. So again, one is describing a, a specific behaviors and one is a judgment uh, on, uh, uh, on, the, on the learner. Uh, another example is when you are mobilizing the colon, your dissection plan was deep and you enter behind the kidney rather than you still don't know the plane of dissection well. So one has a, uh, a tone, like a judgment tone uh, and it's not neutral. So feedback that is focused on the person can damage the person's self-esteem and may result in the rejection of the feedback. Also avoid the peril of praises. So examples are like, you are natural at this. Great job, keep up the good work. So statements like these uh, imply that the person rather than his or her work is being evaluated. So these types of feedback also has um, an addictive quality um, per se, and when the learners come to expect it um, uh, and uh, it is not given, they feel let down or even discouraged. So the, the other thing too is that the learner should be given an opportunity to self-reflect on his or her own performance. So start by asking questions like, how did that go? How did it feel to you? What went well? What could have gone better? So the learner's self-assessment can provide information regarding the learner's insight and understanding of his or her ability when they're performing um, the task. So the learner may bring up the same points that the teacher wants to address, and that could serve as a basis for feedback discussion. So this also allows the learner to identify his or her own weaknesses, and the perception of harshness associated with the negative feedback may be softened a bit, thus making sensitive, corrective feedback feel uh, more acceptable. The feedback session um, can be loaded with emotions. So the learner can feel defensive, uh, they may feel gratified, may be angered, among other uh, emotions. So these reactions are part of the natural response of being observed and being evaluated, uh, and part of it being uh, receiving negative feedback. But they can, uh, these emotions can diminish the student's openness to feedback and can be particularly strong if the feedback is on the area that the learner did not identify as being problematic in the first place. So the learners could view feedback as personal attacks on them. And generally people, um, learners and people in general uh, prefers information that protect the self view. So when they receive negative feedback, they can have really strong emotions. So emotion need to be addressed for feedback to be effective. 
And um, sometimes it may be helpful to normalize reactions um, by saying things like, yeah, these can be really difficult. You know, it's, you know, uh, I understand that it's really difficult to hear, but so the faculty can also check in with the learner uh, about the effect of the feedback. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, there are visual cues that the uh, a teacher can uh, sense from the learner, uh, but they're not really um, uh, expressing um, it in words. So uh, what the teacher can do is try to uh, check in with them and allow them to express their emotions. So by saying things like, what do you think about what I just said? Does this make sense to you? You know, inviting the, uh, the learner to uh, speak and, and express their emotion. It also is helpful for the teacher to learn about the uh, learner's perspective, where they come from, and some of the possible reasons uh, uh, why they behave a certain way. Um, and uh, I think that insight will help the uh, teacher address some of the barriers uh, or um, uh, address some of the action plan also. So helping ad students identify strength and weakness is only part of the task. So feedback is not complete without an action plan for the next step. So learning occurs when people can see both what did not work and what they need to do to improve. So faculty should help learners focus on ways to improve their performance, either by encouraging the learner to continue skills that work well, or by working with the learner on skills identified as needing improvement. So the faculty can engage the learner to generate their own ideas on how to improve and modify them as necessary. If there are barriers to change, the faculty should also help the learner address them. So for the remaining uh, uh, next part of the talk, um, uh, I'm gonna go over some of the models of uh, feedback provision. Uh, these models focus on how feedback is delivered. Um, so there are several of these models um, uh, in the literature and they are relatively, um, uh, some of them are really sim simple uh, and uh, many of them are, are relatively complicated. But for the benefit of time, I'm going to go over just a few uh, models that are popular and simple that can be applied uh, and used um, immediately. And I can provide a reference about the other models if you're interested. Um, the models that I'm going to talk about are the feedback sandwich model, um, the Pendleton model, and the reflective feedback uh, conversation model. Um, the last one there, the multi-source feedback model is actually not a model of, um, of individual uh, feedback delivery, but more of a, um, more of a system uh, model. Uh, and it is worth mentioning as well. So let's start with a, a feedback sandwich model. Uh, this is by far the most popular uh, and the most talked about um, model uh, and the most uh, that I've read about uh, when I was uh, looking, um, reading about this particular topic. And it was first described in the 2000. In this model, uh, the negative feedback uh, is a meat um, and it is sandwiched between the praises. So the purpose here is to make it easier to deliver the bad news and to make it more acceptable. So for example, um, uh, the example I give here. So um, the praise is, you did a good job identifying peptonitis then sandwich in with the criticism. When you examine the patient, she was a lot of, she has, was in a lot of pain and discomfort. I suggest not to do deep palpation once you already recognize that the patient has peritonitis and then follow with another praise. But you did knowledge and treat her pain and that the patient appreciate your attentiveness. So that's like an example of a, of a uh, feedback sandwich. So the advantage of the feedback sandwich is that it is really fast and it is easy to do. Uh, the negative message is packaged within a po uh, the positive uh, messages, making receiving the negative message a little easier. Um, it is particularly helpful when the teacher and uh, learner relationship is relatively new and the teacher has some concern about uh, you know, damaging that relationship. So the disadvantage of the feedback sandwich is that it is unidirectional. Uh, so it's only, only one way. Uh, it does not allow the learner to self-reflect. Um, so, it uh, so it's taking that um, important component of a good uh, and effective feedback out. Uh, the format of the feedback sandwich is rigid and it seems contrived to both the teacher and the learner. Uh, another disadvantage uh, is like um, uh, the sheep and the wolf's clothing effect. 
So the learner uh, who is familiar with the process uh, could be anxiously anticipating the arrival of the negative message and therefore he or she is not hearing the positive messages at all. So whatever it is that you want, a good message that you want to, to, uh, to send and want them to repeat um, the good behaviors, that's kind of out of the window. Uh, conversely, the negative message may be completely diluted by the positive messages. Uh, so leaving the learner without um, uh, any real uh, uh, feedback or a plan for improvement. Um, so the example that I showed about Skeeter uh, uh, sending the messages, uh, sending the feedback to the student. That is a, a, a good example of a feedback sandwich. You start with a positive praise, go through the sort of the things that need uh, improvement, the behaviors that need improvement, and then he ended up with a positive note. So that's a, a classic example again of a, of, a, of a feedback sandwich. The next model is a Pendleton model. It is essentially an extension of the, uh, of the feedback sandwich model by incorporating the self-assessment component. So the self-assessment component in this model make this a bi-directional conversation and it allows a more collaborative approach between the teacher and the learner. So in this model, the teacher starts by asking the learner uh, what went well, and then allow the learner to reflect and respond uh, about what went well. And then next, the teacher asks the learner about what could be improved and then the learner is then allowed to reflect and answer this question. And then the teacher then has an opportunity to then uh, give the, uh, his or her own opinion. Um, so an example is uh, of the Pendleton model is like this. So the teacher, what went well during the case? So the learner answered, I thought that the dissection of the gallbladder hilum went very well. The teacher said, it did. You did a good job dissecting out the hilum and identifying the critical view you should continue to refine this approach. The teacher then asked again, what needs to be improved? Then the learner said, there was a lot of bleeding when I tried to dissect the gallbladder off of the liver bed. And the teacher responded, I noticed that too. Uh, your plane was a little bit too deep. Uh, next time try dissecting the area that has better established plane, then extend your dissection to the more difficult areas. So as you can see in this model, the positives and the negatives are separately focused um, and then there is an opportunity for the learner to reflect. So the disadvantage of this technique, uh, like the feedback sandwich, is that it is also rigid and seems a little bit contrived. So the next model is called the reflective feedback conversation model. So taking the Pendleton model a step further, the reflective feedback conversation model delves into the learner's self-reflection to put the assessment of the performance at the center of the conversation. So the teacher usually start with the learner's concerns on both in positive and the negative areas and what could have been better. And then the teacher will facilitate the reflection and add corrections as needed. So the teacher might pose a questions like, do you have any concerns about your recent performance? What could have done better? Is there anything that might uh, make things easier next time? So in doing this conversation, the teacher would elaborate on the performance. So, you know, extend on it. Uh, um, and then the teacher would then insert some positive statements. So air time, you know, the, the time and the, uh, if the, especially when uh, the teacher perceived that the, the students are having these difficult emotions, then that's when the positive statements were then uh, given. And then check the, uh, on the students, on the understanding of, of the conversation and what, um, uh, what are some of the uh, feedback that you give and then add corrections as needed. So essentially it is just a conversation, but the, the conversation is based on what the perception or what the, the assessment um, that is uh, done by the learner. So whatever the learner's assessment is, uh, the uh, teacher and the learner will then have a conversation about it, but expand on it further. But then the teacher will then inject uh, in uh, the con conversation, some of uh, his or her thought. Uh, um, and then also uh, doing that process um, suggests uh, ways to improve. So sometimes it could be difficult for the learner to properly reflect on the clinical situation and thus making the uh, facilitation of the reflection um, really a crucial component of improving performance. So the example, the second example that I show you on the video is a good example of this, um, uh, of this reflective feedback conversation model.
So there are several other models of feedback delivery uh, uh, I won't, that I won't go over today. Some of them, are, uh, a lot of them are based on the uh, psychology uh, sort of uh, uh, literature, uh, but most of them are really centering on a few important concepts, like creating a, uh, starting with, by creating a relationship with the learner, allowing the learner to reflect on his or her own performance, which then is used as a launching path for the feedback discussion, providing support, coaching the learner to uh, develop the action plan. So all sort of the same thing, but they all structured slightly differently. So uh, another uh, model of feedback worth mentioning is the multi-source feedback model. So also known as a 360 degree evaluation. So I think most of us have heard about this. Um, uh, it is not a model for feedback delivery like the previous models that I just uh, discussed. Uh, but it's more like a system-wide approach to feedback. So it is widely used in the business, uh, business um, world, uh, and um, it is relatively new, uh, newer in the medical, uh, in medicine and uh, medical education. As the name implied, it is set up uh, so that the learner can get feedback from multiple sources, including teachers, peers, nurses, ancillary staff, uh, and patients. The idea is that the learner can get different feedback perspective from different individuals uh, who might be involved in the learning process. So the classic example of the multi-source feedback that I'm familiar with uh, is a CPX uh, or the Clinical Performance uh, Examination Exercise of UCD. It is a longitudinal process. So it takes multiple days and sometimes the whole semester to. Uh, uh, or the whole year, some, uh, uh, I think, uh, the whole third year they, uh, that they do the CPX exercises. So it started with a student um, having uh, a clinical encounter with a standardized patient. And in the room a standardized patient uh, is one standardized patient and then two of the peers and one faculty. So the encounter is also recorded. And at the end of the encounter, the student will get the feedback uh, from the patient. The patient will tell them, uh, uh, how, um, uh, you know, how they, uh, how they perceive the, uh, uh, the doctor is essentially focused more on a patient doctor relationship. And then they would get assessment from the peers and then also from the faculty in the room. And then the students then uh, have a little bit of time to reflect on that feedback inside the room, but the majority of that reflection is gonna be done outside after the fact. Um, at the, uh, so after the encounter, then, then the, uh, the students will then have a chance to review the video and reflect on some of the comments that were made uh, and feedback that were made by their peers and by the patient and the faculty. And then they will come up with areas of strength and weaknesses. Um, and then they will have that discussion with another faculty who is really skilled and experienced in education uh, that will help them develop a plan for improvement. And then uh, the students then is now on with this plan, uh, you know, has this plan in, uh, in place and they will continue to practice some of the, that plan, the skills uh, that they have on their clinical rotation, they continue to practice on it. And then they have to come back later um, uh, uh, and uh, repeat um, uh, another one of these standardized encounter. And the second time around is gonna be a lot higher stake. Um, so that's, that's an example of, uh, of uh, of the multi-source feedback where the student gets uh, um, feedback from multiple individuals and from different uh, perspectives. So in many ways, our surgical practice and quality improvement follow this sort of multi-source feedback model. We receive feedback from our peers at quality improvement meetings and reports on quality assurance data like NetScript and Vizian. And receive, um, we also receive you know, patient satisfaction data. We receive feedback from the hospital system regarding timeliness and medical record completion, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it is everywhere. Um, my understanding is that the multi-source feedback is also mandated by all residency, the ACGME accredited. Um, and I believe that um, I think uh, patient surveys is a required part of the American Board of Internal Medicine's maintenance certification program too. I don't think we have that in uh, general surgery a uh, maintenance certification, but uh, in the internal medicine, that is a component of it. So although the multi-source feedback model has been shown by net, uh, a lot of studies um, in industry as well as medicine to result in individual improvement and adoption of new practices, it is not without um, challenges. 
Um, so a few studies I've reviewed have looked at uh, its validity, uh, particularly in medicine, and that they identify a few challenges. So there are several factors that will influence whether the physician receiving feedback will change. So the first is the source and the content of the feedback. So in general, when the feedback is perceived as positive, the, phys uh, the physicians in general do not change their practice at all. So they view that this is, I'm good, I'm, I'm fine, I'm not gonna change the way I practice. But when the feedback is perceived as negative, you would expect that all of them will, uh, most of them will change, but uh, it turned out that only a little bit more than half of the physicians will, that receive negative feedback uh, will actually, cha uh, actually change their behavior. And when you really ask them why uh, they don't change their behavior, and the reasons they stated is that um, they, they don't think the source uh, is, um, uh, is credible. So if you look at the different sources, physicians tend to view uh, the feedback that they get from their patients as highly credible. And feedback that they get from their patients, they tend to really uh, change. They affect change immediately. But when they receive uh, negative feedback from their peers, um, they are not likely to change. Uh, and they, you, generally they perceive them as less credible because they, they don't view that their peers actually based some of the feedback on direct observations like their patients would. The second thing that really also affect the change is that a specificity of the feedback. Um, uh, so uh, the feedback that physicians receive from the peers, um, especially when it's uh, related to clinical competencies, of, uh, are not very specific at all. As you can imagine, it is hard for anyone to come up with concrete examples uh, to give uh, feedback uh, about the peers when it comes to clinical competence. So these feedback uh, ends up being relatively general. And so the, the physicians who get the feedback uh, tend to view that these feedback are not very credible. And so then they're less likely to affect change. So some of the behaviors that um, tend to improve uh, with these kind of uh, multi-source feedback model is uh, behaviors related to professionalism, uh, uh, team uh, work, and communication skills and patient uh, skills. Those tend to have really good uh, responses, but um, uh, uh, clinical competence or clinical improvement, uh, the, they affect little change uh, when it comes to these kind of models. Uh, another point to make is that um, if the feedback is congruent with the other sources, then it lends more credibility in resulting change. But when the feedback is incongruent, uh, uh, then the phys uh, physicians tend to ignore them uh, as they really don't know what to do with the information. So for example, a feedback that they get from one peer may uh, say one thing and the feedback they get from another peer may be saying something different or feedback from their patients may be different. So that would then leave the person receiving the feedback not knowing what is uh, uh, what is credible and what is not. And so they tend to just ignore them and, and do nothing. So this is one of the challenges associated with this uh, multi-source feedback model. Um, and so when we create these kind of system in our residency or in student um, uh, uh, curriculum, uh, we have to keep uh, this in mind. So I just wanna summarize, uh, just recap a little bit. So feedback is a critical component of the learning process. Uh, there are many models of feedback delivery that can be used, but regardless of which model is being used, there are critical elements of the feedback that will make it more effective. So I'm going to uh, leave you with this last slide with the critical elements that make a feedback effective. So feedback needs to be based on goals and objectives. It should be given timely and frequently. The approach should be neutral and non-judgmental. The feedback should be given based on specific direct observations and it should focus on the behaviors that need modifications rather than the person or interpretation of the person's motivations. It really should, uh, we should avoid general praises. Um, the feedback model being used should allow learners self-reflection um, and the teacher should manage the learner's reaction and facilitate acceptance of the feedback as much as possible. And lastly, the teacher should help the student develop action plan for improvement. So these uh, nine, uh, sort of components here, uh, I just want to leave that as a uh, uh, take home message uh, for this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fan. That was really a wonderful um, overview of the science of uh, feedback in regards to medical education.
Um, and we have uh, time for uh, questions uh, from our audience. I put a question out there. Yes. Um, so Ho, what is your preferred feedback style? You, you mentioned all these different styles. What do you think is the most effective? Do you think that one style fits more, you know, when we're dealing with residents or medical students um, or do you kind of tailor the feedback to the person? What is your, what is your feedback on that yeah. question? <laughs> I think I tend to uh, tailor the feedback. So if I'm, I'm doing a written feedback, so for example, if they give me an H and P uh, that I want to uh, give feedback on, it's kind of hard to have a conversation with the feedback. I think the, the sandwich model, uh, feedback model works well uh, on that because then you kind of give your positive and you give them uh, uh, some of the things that they need improvement on. I think that's, uh, that's a good way to do it when you're, you're sending a written um, uh, evaluate, uh, sort of feedback. Like what Skidder did, that, that was a written, uh, that was a written uh, um, uh, feedback to a student encounter, uh, encounter in clinic. So that's perfect. Um, I think when you have a conversation uh, uh, with a resident or a student, I think um, using either the Pendleton model or the reflective um, uh, feedback conversation is better. I think that because uh, we tend to have a very good relationship with our residents, um, uh, they trust us. Um, I think it's uh, much easier to have a more extensive conversation uh, with them. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I mean, sometime doing the case, it's really hard to give direct feedback. You give direct feedback during the case, but it's hard to follow a lot of that, uh, you know, some of those um, recommendations, like you know, your emotion, you, I mean, you're focusing on the case and then you, you're trying to do the case, but at the same time, uh, trying to observe what the resident is doing, it's really difficult to do. I mean, it's like, uh, you need to find, uh, observe what they do and give them feedback at the same time, focus on the case. I mean, it, it takes a lot of effort. Um, I talk to Skeeter about this all the time. Is that like, yeah, feedback takes, tremendous amount of effort to, to do it well. And uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do it. Um, uh, I think the other thing is, uh, you know, I mentioned about the goals and objective. I think that's really nice to do. I think it is actually, because I can imagine like when you go, we go in a case, um, the chief resident doesn't have to do everything and, the, and there are things for everyone. So uh, I think if time allow, it'd be nice to talk to the third year resident and then the chief resident Say what the what they want to um, what they want to achieve with the case. What do they want to learn with the case? Maybe as junior the residents may benefit from getting to the abdomen and do it well, like do it at midline without getting to the muscles, things like that. And then maybe the chief resident would then focus more on the actual dissection or or something that's more relevant to their um, uh, to their level of training. So I think ideally that would be the way that we should uh, should be doing it. Well, one quick follow up as we may have all experienced this, what happens, what, what should we do when a, a resident or a medical student gets overly emotional during the feedback? I've had where people have yelled, I've had where people have cried, usually they cry, but how do you defervesce, how do you personally defervesce that situation? Because it's kind of what some of us are afraid of when we wanna give the feedback, but we know the person's a little bit fragile. What's your suggestion on that? I think manage the emotion first, uh, always because if they're emotional, there's no way that they take away any message that you uh, that we try to give them. I mean, it, when I mean that the the cognitive uh, um, is a model of learning, basically, if they're emotional, if they stress, there's no way that they can uh, take in anything. So I think that at that point, uh, the most important thing is manage that emotion. And again, the feedback doesn't have to be happening only in one setting. So meaning you manage the emotion first and then the next encounter or the following encounter, I think then uh, driving that message a little bit more. It's like uh, then uh, when the emotion is already in check, um, I think then they will receive the message a little better. So I don't have the best uh, answer either, but I think that will be a reasonable approach. <clears throat> hey, Dr. Fan, I have a, a quick question. You know, you, you highlighted the data that uh, from the medical students survey that said that they, that some of them have gone through without feedback. And that goes towards your, um, your, your advice that feedback should be um, relatively immediate, right? Uh, or quick. Or announced. 
and announced. Yeah. Yes. And so yes. what are your thoughts on, you know, one of the challenges for surgeons to provide feedback is uh, there is a fatigue factor, right? So you, you, you have a difficult yes. case or a, a clinical experience um, and where, you know, a, a, a trainee may be involved with the case. And um, uh, after the case is done, uh, ideally, that would be the, the best time to provide that feedback. Uh, but somehow you're fatigued or stressed or et cetera. Is, is there a way to uh, counteract that or mitigate that in some way to provide at least some modicum of feedback? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a challenging, uh, uh, that's a challenge situation too. Um, but you know, like at the end of the case, the, uh, the circulatory nurse will ask us, uh, let's debrief about the case. Um, I think if, um, I think if we make it a uh, part of a routine that maybe, um, uh, maybe it's less of a, maybe it's perceived as less of a burden. To, I, I guess sometimes it's still perceived as a burden to give feedback, um, uh, to give that debriefing <laughs> at the end of the case. Uh, but if we make it a routine, sometimes we just sort of do it. Um, but then, I mean, if you're tired, if the, everyone is tired, I don't know whether the feedback is going to be that effective at that moment. Uh, you know, if everyone is emotional or tired or, or uh, then uh, it may be too difficult. Um, so I don't know, maybe wait for the next, uh, maybe wait for the next encounter or before the next case. Uh, give them some feedback about that and maybe work on what it's gonna be, uh, how we're gonna correct it for the next case. So that maybe that's one way to do it. But I don't have a, a, a good answer either. But uh, I mean, the feedback could also be relatively short. Uh, one of the thing I didn't mention on there is that, um, uh, the the, uh, the the learner, the person giving the feedback also have to sort of judge the quantity of the feedback. So most people can only receive a couple of learning points, maybe uh, at a maximum of three. So when we give feedback, uh, I guess we have to prioritize what is more important uh, feedback to give and maybe the other feedback can give in at a different time, at a different encounter, but try to make it so that um, it's a little bit um, uh, only a, a maybe one or two teaching points uh, for that particular encounter. And maybe that makes it a little easier to do uh, when everyone is tired, just focus on the one or the two. And I don't know, I hope I answered some questions. Yeah, your question. great, great. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Fan, can I add just a, a question on there to Dr. Cooks, which is um, like, we, we've gotten better, we're trying to get better at like telling the students uh, med students and junior um, residents that this is a feedback session type thing. When those questions came about that you were looking at, was it specifically on the faculty on an attending feedback or is it also including the residents? Because we try and do it as much as we can as well. Yeah, a lot of the literature are, are actually the, the people giving feedback are faculty. And uh, the learners uh, in most of the, uh, the literature that I've looked at are students or residents. Um, and then some of the multi-source feedback, it's in general, it's uh, physicians in, uh, in, in clinical practice and some uh, are, uh, are residents. I mean, you can't, you can't imagine how easy, uh, difficult it must have been to do some of those studies because they require like uh, feedback from patients and feedback from, from, from nurses and ancillary staff. It, right. it does take some effort to to have that kind of a system. I was and thinking. I don't know. Uh, residency have that here. I I know that I don't know. You guys get uh, any uh, evaluations from patients or nurses? We don't necessarily. We I mean only when you get written up for being tired on call all night. Um, but most of the time. Uh, <laughs> but that's. Not <laughs> is there a? Uh, but I mean the students like the the students that come through a surgical rotation. Um, I know that our like feedback rates are pretty abysmal, but the question, you know, I don't know if that's coming from, if the question is asked, is it a faculty member that evaluates you or is it any evaluations? Uh, any feedback evaluation from anyone. Uh, so when the student answers those questions, it could be from anyone. And I suspect all of them receive some form of feedback one way or another during the rotation. The issue here is that they don't perceive it as feedback or they don't perceive it as effective feedback. So that's where, that's where we need to do better is that we have to give them feedback that is more effective. And then every time we give feedback, we should really announce it. We say, I'm gonna give you feedback on what you just did. 
And so I think that will, that 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 helps in many ways. It helps that they will they know that feedback is coming, so that they can you know they can report it as such. But then the more important aspect is that they need to be prepared when you give them feedback. They have to be mentally prepared so that they can take in the message uh, appropriately. Great, wonderful. Well, uh, that hits the 4 p.m. mark, and I uh, really appreciate Dr. Fan is really wise advice. And I look forward, uh, I'm not providing you with a feedback sandwich right now, I'm just giving you um, <laughs> non-productive accolades. So uh, thank you uh, very much, and thank you for uh, uh, our uh, audience for attending today. Thank you, everyone. All right, take care. Take care.